The Suns got swept, the Philadelphia Joel Embiid's are down 3-1, the Clippers almost blew the biggest playoff lead in history, and the Bucks are running out of players. So much stuff going on in the NBA right now, let's talk about it. Quick question, we're gonna come back to this. How long ago do you think this video was? I posted this yesterday. That is me. How many years ago do you think this video was? So the Sun season is now over. They got swept in the first round by the Timberwolves and game four really looked a lot like some of the other games. They looked competitive. They were good in the first half. They lost the second half and now the series is over and the season is over for the Phoenix Suns. And we talked about this in one of the other videos, right? Bradley Beal talking about the fact that he's never been swept a day in his life. Uh, as the Timberwolves account pointed out, First time for everything. What a disastrous way for the season to end for Phoenix. And of course, immediately after the game, as is tradition, anytime you are forced out of the playoffs, anytime you have an embarrassing end of the season, you have a lot on the line, all of the stories suddenly come out about your team after the games are over, they've got them ready to go. Apparently, shockingly, Kevin Durant not happy with his role in the offense in Phoenix. Didn't like the way that the offense was ran, thought it was too focused around pick and rolls and too focused on him just standing in the corner, not fitting towards his strengths enough. It was too focused on Bradley Beal and Dev Devin Booker pick and rolls. Of course, we're hearing about this now. And of course, we're also hearing about the fact that we have to have a fall guy. Hello, Frank Volger, it's gonna be you. Apparently his job is now in jeopardy after one season in Phoenix. Despite all the injuries they had to deal with over the year, despite all of the changes that they made in the off season, continually adding guys, of course, it's this guy's fault, right? It's just so funny to me how it's so predictable every single time a team loses like this. Now we've got stories about how Vogel had some kind of locker room out outburst and, and players were rolling their eyes and they didn't actually respect Frank Vogel. Okay, had, let's say theoretically, if they won 4-1 in the first round, we're not getting this story, at least not until they lose in the playoffs. Like none of this stuff is relevant until they have some kind of embarrassing playoff exit. And now let's all focus on Frank Vogel. Let's all focus on the fact that he was the he was the problem and he was a bad coach. Not about the fact that the stars didn't play particularly well, not about the fact they didn't bring enough physicality, energy, or effort and got smoked. Now let's talk about the coach. And not to overly hate on the Suns or anything, but this was interesting. Every Phoenix Suns playoff series win in the Devin Booker era. Hmm. Now that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but uh, it might mean something. And I'm sure plenty of people today are gonna be talking about what's the off season gonna look like in Phoenix? How can they make some moves? How can they change things around? They're a couple of moves away from actually being a really good team. Change the coach, make some changes to the roster. Here's the problem. This is the roster, as is pointed out here. Like, they can't do anything. This has been an untenable situation in terms of future roster flexibility from the moment that they traded for Bradley Beal. They were locked into this group. Bradley Beal still today has a no trade clause. If in the offseason they wanted to trade Bradley Beal for a second round pick and a giant expiring contract just to get him off the team, they couldn't do it. He would have the option to say, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'd like to stay in Phoenix. And he can just activate his no trade clause. I don't know why I said activate, but I'm sure I'll find a way to make that make sense. I mean, this was the point of the second apron and the Suns knew that these rules were going into effect next year when they made all of these changes, when they brought in Bradley Beal, when they traded away all these picks, when they did all this stuff, they knew that this was going to be a thing and it resulted in exactly zero playoff wins. Not to bring in like two negative thoughts about the Suns here, but like, Think about all the teams that didn't make the play-in, that didn't make the playoffs. They have the same number of playoff wins this year as the Phoenix Suns do. They can't aggregate players together in trades. They can't take back more money in salary than they send out in a trade. They don't have a mid-level exception to sign this offseason, and they can only sign their own draft picks, which they don't really have very many of. I think they have their own second round pick, and minimum contract players. Other than that, that's gonna be the roster next year, what we have here. Now, I do wanna make sure that we give credit to Minnesota, right? They were awesome in this series, their physicality, their size, their strength. Anthony Edwards was awesome for most of the series. And even with like a really, I was gonna say a weird Carl Anthony Town series, but actually for the playoffs, this is pretty on point for him to just constantly get random fouls and not really be that impactful. But even with guys not playing particularly well at certain parts of the series, they still swept a team that a lot of people thought was just as good as them going into the series. Also wanna take one second and say like, this, this really, really sucks. I mean, could you imagine the Timberwolves are not a historically successful playoff franchise, right? Chris Finch is one of the better coaches in the league, certainly one of the candidates for coach of the year this year, although he didn't win it. And your team smokes the Suns in the first round and you get hurt near the end of the game. And like you can celebrate with your team, but not really. And it's like a really, really serious injury as well. So hopefully Chris Finch feels better. Bro head look like the first slice of bread. I'm not even sure what that means, but officially I'm offended. Tucker, he meant your head looks like the outside of a loaf of bread as in the side that is baked. You're welcome. M. Okay, so we have two options here. Um, 
Do we think I look more like this or more like this? <laughs> Which was he referring to? All right, now we're gonna talk about the Philadelphia Joel Embiid's versus the New York Knicks. Unfortunately, Philadelphia is down 3-1 in the series. It looks like their season is all but over, even though a lot of these games have been close. These are just two devastating losses for Philadelphia to try and recover from. This one, as well as game two. And KOC points this out. Joel Embiid just logged the 11th postseason loss of his career, which he finished with a positive plus minus. And it happened in all three losses of Sixers Knicks. The Sixers are now plus 34 with Embiid on the floor in the series and minus 37 without him. And the crazy thing is, Maxi has been awesome. It's just they're not good enough without Embiid on the floor. It's just not tenable for them to compete with really good teams in the conference without Embiid out there. And by the way, he's not even fully healthy and he's still been really good at points in the series. This is a massive issue moving forward for Philadelphia, not only within this series, but also for the future of the franchise because you don't know at what point everything is just gonna fall apart for Embiid anyway, especially as he continues to fight through all of these injuries. Probably should just leave that on the ground. Sit. Luna, sit. <laughs> okay, sorry. And how reliant they are on Embiid is definitely showing up late in these games. He didn't sit for a single second in the second half because Nick Nurse knows that they're gonna give up five, six points in the minutes that Joel Embiid sits. And unfortunately for Embiid, that has manifested itself in really, really poor fourth quarters, and especially in game four. But again, just like in the first section, I wanna make sure I'm giving credit to the other team as well. It's not just the Sixers lost or the, the Philadelphia Joel Embiid's lost, it's that the Knicks won and they were awesome. Jalen Brunson set playoff records for the Knicks in this game. Uh, Kelly Oubre though, not that impressed. <laughs> I love someone pointed out on Twitter too, cause he's talking about, oh, he's getting mismatches. Uh, Kelly Oubre probably is one of those mismatches. And to me, this kind of comes across as Kelly Oubre saying like, I mean, if I got 34 shots, I could have scored almost 50 in this game as well, which one, definitely not true, Kelly Oubre, and two, just like a awful, terrible look after a playoff game that arguably they should have won for him to come out and say, ah, it's not that impressive that he dropped almost 50 because he shot 34 times. Also really respect the tweet saying Kelly Oubre on how Jalen Brunson dropped 47 on him and the Sixers. Just a little jab there. I respect that. You got to stop wearing hats, dude. You're an adult. Does it make you feel better that the hat that I wear really often in these videos, what is my hair doing? This is why I wear hats, by the way. The hat that I wear really often in these videos um, has a Millennium Falcon on it. Does that make you feel better or worse about the fact that I'm an adult? And honestly, wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up, but like the thread that this comment is under, absolutely wild. Go check it out. Next up, we've got Clippers Mavs, and this game was out of control. I've watched almost every minute of every single playoff game so far, and I almost stepped away from the TV on this one because the Clippers were up 31 in this game. They were hitting every shot. Paul George was awesome in the first half. The Clippers, as is illustrated here, had unbelievable shooting numbers, yet still somehow the game was kind of close, which historically like just doesn't happen. And once again, Kyrie got off to a slow start and then was awesome in the second half. And also, once again, Luka just doesn't look 100%. He's talked about it. He's dealing with some kind of knee injury issue. And like, it's... He's still, you know, impressive and scoring well, but not very efficient, a ton of step back threes, which he always takes a lot of those, but it almost feels like that's the only thing he can get to consistently right now. And I'll be honest, during the game, I was kind of rooting for the Mavs to come back and win the game because the Clippers of all franchises tying the record for the biggest blown lead in NBA playoff history at 31 would have been absolutely hilarious. And also, by the way, the, the two games that the Clippers have won in the series and looked really impressive, Kawhi didn't play in either of them. And I, I feel like we need to talk about the Kawhi thing. Like, I, I don't know why it is that their offense looks so much smoother when Kawhi isn't out there. He's continually dealing with knee injury issues and that's what made him miss this game as well. He's probably gonna be out for the rest of the postseason. Like, I can't imagine, like every everybody that's a fan of an NBA team, I'm a fan of the Nets, you guys all have your fandoms. You all have, you know, frustrating postseason. There are times in which you're like, man, I wish this team could get it together. Could you imagine being one of the 12 Clippers fans on the planet and be like, man, every single time we get to the postseason, it looks like we have a good chance we're just missing our best player like could you imagine every single time the Sixers get into the postseason Joel Embiid gets actually Joel Embiid that that him getting hurt no that does happen but could you imagine like every time in recent playoff history the Lakers look like they're going to go on a run and then LeBron or Anthony Davis they have an injury we know that happens too or, or what about like when all of your stars play together like the Nets for example a couple years ago all your stars play together everybody looks awesome and then they just continue to get hurt uh, right when it matters and then Kevin Durant's still awesome and you lose in game seven anyway despite probably being the best team in the league that year
I don't, I don't even know if I want to finish the video. But yeah, like still an unfortunate situation for the Clippers. They're, they're still capable of winning the series, by the way. It's 2-2. They have home court advantage and they've won the two games that Kawhi hasn't played in, but still got to be frustrating, right? Last up, let's talk about Bucks Pacers. And oh my gosh, that just came out of nowhere. Wanna prove, wanna prove. This, however, I have beef with this. Not this part. This part's fine. How dare you? That commercial is goaded. BK, have it your way. You rule. All right, last up, let's talk about Bucks Pacers. Bobby Portis, what are we doing, my guy? I mean, realistically, Milwaukee's probably not winning the game anyway because Indiana just, by the way, three different times in the series, I think it's Greg Anthony, whoever's calling the games, has referred to them as Indianapolis. Uh, that would be the NFL. These are the Indiana Pacers, not the Indianapolis Pacers. Anyway, um, they're probably not winning the game anyway because the Pacers just didn't miss threes. They shot incredibly well. And even though, I mean, Brooke Lopez stepped up, Malik Beasley had a decent game, Chris Middleton looked pretty good. Even as like crazy as it was that Bobby Portis found a way to get himself ejected, which by the way, was 100% warranted. You cannot do this. Certainly, you just can't put yourself in this situation, whether you think he should have been ejected or not. Just, just don't do this when you're like the second best player on the team in a given night and you're Bobby Portis. And at this point, Bucks down 3-1. It seems unlikely that Dame is going to play in game five. It seems extremely unlikely that Giannis is going to play in game five. Things are looking very, very rough for Milwaukee. And honestly, like if they were to lose the first round series against Indiana, like that would be unfortunate. It would have been nice if Giannis and Dame and these guys were healthy. But like, I'm not convinced that they were really going to do much in the postseason anyway. I've been down on this team all year. The midseason coaching change. This is just probably the destiny of this Bucks team just based on how the year has gone. And like, if you need any proof of that, we've got like Danilo Gallinari doing stuff. We've got AJ Green and Malik Beasley closing games there at the end. And at the point at which Chris Middleton sprained his ankle and I thought he might not come back in a game, uh, I put this one out. We talked about this in the intro. Yeah, um, I'm, what am I? How old am I? I actually don't even know how old I am. I know I'm not 30 yet, but this video was like five years and about 30 pounds ago and also I'm 6'4 so like it's not super impressive but that didn't stop me from throwing it out there <laughs> and that's everything that happened in the NBA day and that's everything that happened in the NBA yesterday BK have it your way you rule gotta hype yourself up sometimes <clears throat> and that's everything that happened in the NBA yesterday I'll see you all next time